Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Indigo's conference call to discuss the fourth quarter and fiscal year 2022 financial results. My name is Fezan, and I'll be your coordinator. At this time, the participants are in a listen-only mode. A question and answer session will follow today's management discussion. As a reminder, today's conference call is being recorded. I would now like to turn the call over to your moderator, Ms. Richa Chabra from the Investor Relations team of Indigo. Thank you, and over to you, ma'am. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the fourth quarter and fiscal year 2022 earnings call. We hope that you and your families are safe and in good health. We have with us our Chief Executive Officer, Dono Joy Datta, and our Chief Financial Officer, Gaurav Negi, to take you through our performance for the quarter. Wolfgang Talk Shower, our Chief Operating Officer, Sanjay Kumar, our Chief Strategy and Revenue Officer, and Kiran Koteshwar, our Chief Program Officer and Head of Investor Relations, are also with us and are available for the Q&A session. Before we begin, please note that today's discussion may contain certain statements on our business or financials which may be construed as forward-looking. Our actual results may be materially different from these forward-looking statements. The information provided on this call is as of today's date and we undertake no obligation to update the information subsequently. A transcript of today's call will also be archived on our website. We will upload the transcript of today's prepared remarks by day end. The transcript of the Q&A session will be uploaded subsequently. With this, let me hand over the call to Zono Datta. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us on this. We reported a net loss of 16.8 billion rupees, excluding foreign currency loss of 6.1 billion rupees, a net loss aggregated to 10.7 billion rupees. We swung from a profitable third quarter to a loss-making fourth quarter because of around 15% higher fuel prices, around 11% lower capacity due to Omicron, and a lower ask of 2.9%. For the year ended 22, we reported a net loss of 61.6 billion rupees, excluding foreign currency loss of 9.4 billion rupees, our net loss aggregated to 52.2 billion rupees. Excluding currency impact, our operating losses reduced by around 18% year over year. We deployed around 55% higher capacity and reported around 77% higher revenue from operations in the fiscal year 2022 as compared to the fiscal year 2021. Our financial results for the full year and the reported quarter was severely affected by the pandemic, first by the Delta wave and then by the Omicron wave, which hit us this quarter. Even with these challenges, we served around 50 million passengers in fiscal year 2022, an increase of 62% as compared to fiscal year 2021. Focusing specifically on the fourth quarter, it would be helpful to break the revenue discussion into two distinct periods of six weeks each. The first six weeks saw significantly lower demands because of Omicron. We operated an average of 1,098 flights per day with below average yields. However, we saw a strong rebound in the six weeks starting mid-February once the rate of Omicron infection reduced. During this mid-February to March period, we operated an average of 1,366 daily flights with a strong uptick in unit revenue. While overall RAS during the March quarter reduced by 2.9% to 3.97 rupees, primarily due to reduction in load factor by 3%, as compared to the December quarter. Yields have remained a good story and held steady at 4.40 rupees. Importantly, this is comparing a seasonally weak March quarter to a seasonally strong December quarter. As per the official aviation guide, Indigo emerged as the sixth largest airline in the world and the fastest in terms of growth. We were ranked number four in terms of punctuality worldwide. It is exciting to see Indigo among the top airlines in the world, both in terms of scale and quality of service. 
Towards the end of March, the government allowed international scheduled operations. We ended the quarter with over 100 international flights and are currently operating over 90% of our pre-COVID international flights. We also announced our proposed strategic partnership with Qantas Group. This proposal will be the fifth arrangement with an international carrier, along with American Airlines, Air France KLM, Qatar Airways, and Turkish Airlines. These partnerships will help Indigo access new markets and a new set of customers. We reported a CASC, or unit cost, of 4.79 rupees for the March quarter, which is 18.9% higher sequentially. This higher unit cost was primarily attributable to adverse moment, uh, movement in rupees, reduction in capacity deployment, and increase in fuel prices. We have just experienced two very turbulent years in our history. And this would be a good time to step back and assess Indigo's performance. We were hit by three waves of COVID-19, which caused a sharp decline in demand. We witnessed a sharp rise in fuel prices over the last few months. Capacity and aircraft utilization was severely curtailed. We reported large back-to-back -back losses totaling 119.7 billion rupees over the two years. We also experienced a, experienced a significant strain on our balance sheet. There is no question that we have taken it on the chin in terms of COVID, fuel prices, and operating losses. Now let us ask ourselves how Indigo has responded to this crisis. We strengthened our domestic network. We focused on superior customer service to ensure a higher share of passengers. We right-sized our workforce. We improved our yields in an impressive manner. We positioned ourselves for an aggressive international expansion with building connecting traffic at the hubs and negotiating multiple code share arrangements. We significantly restructured our fleet to ensure low maintenance costs and low fuel burn, the two key drivers of our costs. We launched new initiatives, such as cargo freighters and digital. We strengthened our relationship with our business partners. We restored our free cash balance to 76.6 billion rupees. Along with all these operational factors mentioned above, I would also like to highlight that we have exercised continuous improvement in governance, compliance, and ESG initiatives. The problems we have experienced in our two-year performance, such as COVID, fuel, large losses, etc., are of course all cyclical in nature. In contrast, all our responses have been strategic and sustainable in nature. Consequently, I'm proud to say we have emerged as one of the top 10 airlines in the world, both in terms of size and quality, and importantly, we're the fastest in terms of growth. Looking ahead, we are blessed to be domiciled in probably the most exciting aviation market in the world. And within that market, we are structurally the strongest player. Therefore, we are extremely bullish on our long-term outlook. We would like to thank our shareholders for the patience during these difficult times and assure them that profitability is very much on the top of our mind. Now let me hand over the call to Gaurav to discuss the financial performance in detail. As you are aware, Gaurav Negi has joined us as a new CFO. Gaurav has been with Indigo from December 2021. He has vast experience spanning across more than two decades in several reputed organizations. And we're excited to have Gaurav as part of our team. Over to you, Gaurav. Thank you, Ronald. Good evening, everyone. Uh, for the quarter ended March 2022, we reported a net loss of 16.8 billion rupees. Excluding the foreign exchange in tax, we reported a net loss of 10.7 billion rupees. We reported an EBITDA of 1.7 billion rupees for the quarter ended March 2022, compared to an EBITDA of 20 billion rupees for the quarter ended December 21. For the year ended March 2022, we reported a net loss of 61.6 billion rupees. Excluding the foreign exchange impact, we reported a net loss of 52.2 billion rupees compared to a net loss of 63.3 billion rupees for the year ended March 2021. 
We reported an EBITDA of 11.5 billion rupees for the year ended March 2022, compared to an EBITDA of 6.2 billion rupees for the year ended March 21, an increase of around 84% against a capacity increase of around 55%. Now, some of the key variations of our performance in the March quarter as compared to the December quarter are as follows. Yield for the quarter remained steady at 4.40 rupees. Reduction in load factors by three points led to a cash decrease of 2.9%. Our fuel cash increased by 10.9% sequentially to 1.58 rupees, driven by an increase in average fuel price by around 11%. Our cash X fuel X for, for the March quarter was 2.91 rupees, which is around 12% higher than the December quarter, primarily due to the operate, operating at a lower capacity. The update on cash is as follows. We ended the March quarter with a free cash of 77.6 billion rupees, a marginal net reduction of half a billion rupees versus the December quarter. Our total cash as on March 31, 2022 was 182.3 billion rupees. On the other key balance sheet numbers, we ended the quarter with a capitalized operating lease liability of 316.7 billion rupees and total debt, including the capitalized operating lease liability of 368.8 billion rupees. Our ROU assets at the quarter end was 204.4 billion rupees. The demand has picked up well during the latter half of March quarter. Resumption of scheduled international travel will help us improve our margins. Based on our current estimates, our total capacity deployment in the fiscal year 2023 in terms of ASKs will be in the range of 55 to 60 percent higher than our capacity deployed in the fiscal year 2022, which would roughly translate into 13 to 17 percent growth as compared to our pre-COVID fiscal year of 2020. Specifically for the first quarter of fiscal year 2023, we expect the capacity to rebound at almost 2.5 times the capacity deployed in the first quarter of fiscal year 2022. We are encouraged by the improvement in revenue performance, but currently challenged by an increase in fuel and weakening rupee. In order to address these headwinds, we are taking countermeasures, but meaningful improvement in these two macro drivers will be critical for us to transition back on a path of profitability. With this, let me hand it back to Richard. Thank you, Rono and Gaurav. To answer as many questions as possible, I would, I would like to request that each participant limit themselves to one question and one brief follow-up question, if needed. And with that, we are ready for the Q&A. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on the touchstone telephone. An operator will take your name and announce your turn in the question queue. Participants are requested to use requested to only use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. Reminder to the participants, anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one. First question is from the line of Binay Singh from Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Uh, hi team, uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, Congratulations for a good performance in a very challenging environment. Overall, we are trying to understand how to think about profitability uh, into the coming year. Clearly, in terms of capacity, this will be a record year for Indigo, and even on traffic side, we are seeing very good traction. So could you talk a little bit about uh, how are the yields playing out? Are you able to pass on the cost pressures? Uh, maybe to answer that, if you could share how were your wheels, yields in the second half of March quarter? Because I, as I understand that this, the yield that you've reported also would have been adversely hit by very weak yields in the first half. So could you share a, share, share a few thoughts on how to think about profitability? Uh, secondly, the forex loss looks much larger than uh, we anticipated. Could you talk a little bit about that also? Thank you. Okay, so how do we get back to profitability? Um, as you said, uh, there really is a tug of war going on. And the tug of war is between, I think, a very good revenue performance and a very challenging uh, fuel and um, uh, the rupee weakening. 
and just staying on the revenue side, uh, I, I think I'm really impressed with what our team has done on the revenue side, and I congratulate them for doing a great work. Um, it's not been easy. It, it's clearly very... Um, you almost have to hit the point, the sweet spot, just right, because you can keep pushing up fares, and then at a certain point, um, demand actually falls off. So judging which that point is and just pushing it to the right level, I think, is the sort of a science and the art of all this. And again, our revenue team is doing a great job. Uh, March was the strongest uh, uh, month last quarter. And to give you a sense of where the trends are going, uh, April unit revenue was 6% higher than March. And then May month to date unit revenue was, again, another 6% higher than April. Uh, which is what I mean by the revenue guys. Are doing. Uh, but to counter, sort of balance that story though, uh, April fuel prices were 11% higher than March, and um, May fuel prices were 6% uh, higher than April. So you have a tug of war, uh, but the key to profitability is to keep uh, managing our business on the revenue side. Uh, of course, costs need to be under control, that's always said, but we won't save ourselves into profitability. We have to get it uh, from the revenue side. And uh, at the same time, uh, hopefully we get a break on fuel and, and the rupee. Did I answer your question? Uh, so just to give us an idea, so what was your March yield? Uh, do we have a monthly breakup? Just so that we can understand that, you know, what are the yields trending in absolute sense? Uh, we'll, we'll give it, what was the mark you know? Uh, we'll find that in a second. Uh, while you're looking for it, um, Gaurav, you want to talk about the Forex? You had a question on Forex, right? Why is it so big? Yeah, Vinay, on the Forex front, the impact has been around 600 crores. Now, that's largely because the rupee has weakened approximately two points between December and uh, March. So a large chunk of the forex impact that you're seeing is mark to market. Given that the balance sheet that we have is close to 300 crores of uh, capital lease, uh, leases that we have, that will give you that uh, we've got a 600 crore FX in impact coming into quarter, largely because the rupee weakening by two points in one form. Okay, Sanjay just tells me that the March yield was 5.14. March was 2.71. Sorry, 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 April was 5.14. April was 5.1, oh, March was 4.7. Uh, so, Bina, I hope you're done with that. Next question. Uh, thanks, team. Uh, I'll come back in the question queue. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Deepika Mundra from JP Morgan. Please go ahead. Uh, good evening and thanks for the opportunity. Uh, just following up on yield, uh, so March 4.7, April 5.1, what would be the, uh, uh, how much of the delta would be potentially from the reopening of international flights? Um, well, we don't want to get too much in detail now. I already feel like I've given too many numbers. <laughs> so, look, uh, international, has, I can say the international profitability has been stronger than domestic. And it always is, so that's the good news. But I don't want to now break up yield into domestic versus international. Okay, uh, and uh, the, the the significant capacity increase that you're planning for uh, next year, uh, could you give us a sense as to how much of that skew is again towards international versus domestic? So I can only give you our long-term trajectory on this. Um, Short-term, as you can imagine, there's a lot of volatility. For example, uh, Sri Lanka is a problem. Uh, it's not opening as fast as we'd like. Uh, China is absolutely closed. So there'll be some um, sort of start go through the process. Overall, uh, pre-COVID, our capacity was 25% of our system. Uh, our projection is that in five years from now, international will be about 40% of us. So international will be growing faster, but uh, the rate of growth will very much depend on how markets open up separately or individually. Understood. And if I may just sneak in one more, uh, the code share agreements, how do they pan out in terms of profit dynamics uh, as compared to uh, uh, flights run singularly by Indigo? So uh, the key to making money on code share is flow rate agreements. Uh, so every time a passenger from KLM or Qatar or anyone gets on a flight, 
The question is, uh, how, what sort of pro rate are we charging them, and how do we compare to our alternatives? Um, so, uh, we have a good position in the marketplace, as you know, and therefore are able to negotiate quite attractive pro rates, and therefore we are excited about our um, code share agreement. Okay, thank you so much, and good luck for next year. Thank you, we need it. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Mithul Shah from Reliance Securities. Please go ahead. Good evening, sir. Thank you for giving me opportunity. Sir, the way rupee movement is happening in this quarter in April and May, even slightly sharper than the previous quarter, then which implies that the losses could be like a 7,800 crore this quarter. Is it a right understanding or even more than that? Um, we know that, uh, look, so I don't know how you, how investors generally look at above the line and below the line. So mm -hmm. we are trying desperately to be profitable above the line. But if the rupee keeps going as it's going and then we have this big mark to market correction, then below the line we take a big hit. Uh, so, yeah, as the rupee depreciates uh, further, you can expect big mark-to-market uh, -market adjustments. Sir, my second question is on uh, what is the uh, kind of a feedback or you people are experiencing after a uh, sharp price hike on the ticket side, ticket price increases, what is the response on the customer side till the affordability seems to be uh, reasonable or do you think or do you feel any negative, sizable, noticeable negative impact on the traffic side? So, so clearly it's a balancing game. Um, if, you, if you see is the customer resistance to higher prices, you see it on the load factors, right? Uh, I wish our load factors were higher than they are, and they're not because, yeah, we are getting some resistance. At the same time, the fact that we're getting unit revenue up, which is what's important. It doesn't matter whether you take it on yield or in um, load factors. You want the unit revenue to keep going up, and we're doing quite well on unit revenue, and we're pleased with the performance. Uh, so, yeah, there will be load uh, factor pressure as we increase prices. No question. Uh, lastly, on the after this uh, capacity <clears throat> utilization and capacity increase for FY23, whichever number you indicated, would that be uh, close to pre-COVID level or even higher, or still it will remain below pre-COVID level? We are already higher than pre-COVID level. We've, uh, we've like we said, it's going to be close to 13 to 17 percent higher. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, sir. So, I mean, you know, through all these questions, I just have to emphasize the revenue performance has really been good. And I would say surprisingly good. And thanks again to our uh, commercial team. They're doing a great job on the revenue side. Um, as you uh, alluded, is the customer pressure, is the customer resistance? My God, these fares are going up. But we have to, to survive. With fuel doing what it's doing, we have to raise fares. And as you said many times, India has the lowest fares in the world. Uh, so I, I hope that the stories are sustainable over the long term. We do need to have IFS. Uh, but this fuel and the rupee really are a problem. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Understood, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Chintan Shet from Samiksha Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Am I audible? Mr. Shet, sorry to interrupt you. The audio is not uh, clear from your line. Am I audible? Yes. Hello. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, uh, on on the on the capacity again, um, uh, uh, with with uh, industry getting consolidated and uh, new players are trying to get uh, you know start the operations, and our plan of uh, very strong capacity addition next year. Uh, do you foresee what what do you what's your take on yield? Uh, how how it will pan out? Um, so, the industry has been behaving quite rationally, I'm pleased to say. We do have a lot of players already. And everyone recognizes with the fuel doing what it's doing, with the large losses we've incurred, we all need to repair balance sheets. Uh, so, I, I am hopeful uh, that the new players are actually seasoned players. If you look at the management team at both uh, Akasa and um, Jet Airways and so forth, they're seasoned players. So I 
I expect that the rational, rational behavior will continue, and we wouldn't see any crazy price wars or anything like that. And second on uh, small bookkeeping, uh, sequentially we see OPEX as well as, uh, you know, uh, employee costs uh, rising. I understand that uh, we must have planned uh, uh, for better capacity, but uh, because of Omicron, we kind of need to pull back our capacity and that resulted into, you know, timing-wise uh, uh, rationalizing our cost. So going forward, uh, what, what kind of run rate we should look at? Um, if if you if you can provide some light on that, yes. you're talking of employee costs specifically. Yes. Yeah. Sequentially, it has increased both uh, employee costs and other opex. Uh, so I'm just trying to understand how how should the trajectory look like. So um, employee costs clearly um, we have some snap snap back in wages. And it's not over yet. Uh, as you know, for example, uh, pilots we've given eight um, percent and promised them the six and a half in November, and we'll keep looking at those numbers. And uh, you know, as profitability improves, we will um, be doing some fair raises along the way. And so yeah, rates will go up um, uh, as far as productivity goes. That's where our emphasis is. Uh, so, uh, in every department, uh, from flight crews to operations to uh, commercial, we're looking at employee productivity and trying to sort of manage that as best as we can. But at uh, actual pay rates, yes, you would expect them to go up in an inflationary environment. Any, any number in terms of ask or a percentage growth? Or? No, no. I mean, it, it's a very delicate, and uh, again, just like we say, we have to manage revenue very carefully. We have to manage this also very carefully. We have to be absolutely um, conscious of the fact that our employees are facing an inflationary environment and that we need to give pay raises. Uh, we are very conscious of the fact that they've all worked very hard through two years of COVID. Um, at the same time, uh, we need to keep an eye on the profitability of the company as well. So it is a balancing act, and I wouldn't like to give any forecasts. And other expense uh, from 742 to 834 crores uh, sequentially? Again, in, uh, sequentially, we had the one-off in Q, uh, Q3. So excluding that, there have been some increases in OPEX cost uh, in line with some of our increases that we've seen in international operations. That is driving some of the cost up. But uh, again, to Rora's point, in terms of as a percentage of ASK, that's what we'll be focused on. And we try to keep it uh, lower in terms of as a percentage of ASK versus just looking at an absolute number. Okay. Sure. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Arvind Sharma from City. Please go ahead. Hello, good evening, sir, and thanks for taking my question. Uh, first question, sir, would be on your fleet strategy when you give that uh, number for ASK. Is there any uh, is there any fleet number in mind? Because on a quarter on quarter basis, your absolute amount of planes have gone down. So, is there any number that you have in mind for FY23 in terms of fleet expansion? So, part of the reason why our capacity is going up because we have such a large number of AC21s coming. Um, I mean, it's become a very significant part of our fleet. Uh, as you said before, our overall um, fleet count won't change much. It will be roughly flat, but the capacity will go up because of higher gates. Thanks, sir. Uh, that's, that's helpful. Uh, secondly, sir, I think this has been in a way alluded to uh, in previous comments. The fares have risen quite sharply, but still demand is holding on. Where do you think is, is that inflection point where uh, you know, anything beyond that uh, in terms of increase in fares would start impacting demand negatively? Even this, in, uh, is, this is a balancing act and it's a day-to-day -day activity and a almost minute-by-minute minute activity. We have to just watch the loads carefully. Our job is to maximize the revenue on each flight. And, and whether it comes from load factors or yields, uh, we are sort of agnostic to that. Uh, but we need to push revenues for flight up, and that's what we're focused on doing. Um, within that, I would say um, that uh, our customer service is very, very strong. Um, and, and if we have a strategy on customer service, it's almost like uh, we want to make sure that the customer um, has to almost ask themselves, why would I make a mistake of not booking Indigo? 
So through the entire process, in the front end and in the back end. In the front end, we make sure we give more frequencies, more connectivity, so the customer wants to book us. Um, when they fly us, we make sure we provide reliable service, we are courteous. And even after the travel, we want to build trust with the customer. If you lose your bag, if you need a refund, you can trust and you go to do it just right. So um, part of our revenue strategy is just build great customer service and, and make sure you get a disproportionate share of the industry revenue. Sure, thank, thank you so much, sir. If you could just inform, sir, on, this, on, on the same lines, uh, does the floor and the, uh, the ceiling on the fare still exist in terms of the regulatory? Very much so, yes. Very much so, yes. Okay, and uh, okay. So, and, and you don't expect it to go away. So, you expect those that bit discrepancy in the 15-day window and beyond to stay for some uh, time. Hard to tell. Uh, right now they're here, and we abide by them. All right. Thank you so much for taking my question. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Aditya Mongya from Kotak Securities. Please go ahead. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thanks for the opportunity. Uh, uh, my first question was um, on the growth that you envisage for uh, air traffic in general. If uh, the yields uh, kind of stick around the five rupee or higher mark, I'm just trying to get a sense whether the past growth rates can still be repeated after, let's say, a one-year lull, or should one structurally start thinking about lower growth rates for the sector? Um. So I, I, I'm not sure I understood your question exactly, but you're saying at higher yields, do we expect the growth to continue? So look, um, let's do total industry revenue. As you know, industry revenue is roughly two, two, grows twice as fast as the economy. And fact is, uh, there is pretty strong growth in the economy. We had uh, a downturn, but then we recovered nicely. And you look at all the um, parameters such as GST collections and all that, and it tells you, hey, the industry, the economy is fairly strong. So as long as the economy is strong, we expect uh, industry revenues as a whole to grow. Now, whether we take it again in yields or in volume, it's up to the rational players in the industry to decide. And clearly with high oil prices, you can't take it in volume. You have to take it in yields. Uh, so that's where we are as an industry. Yeah, as in, as in just to kind of uh, clarify this more, uh, let's say the period from 2010 to 2020 saw so air volumes growing at uh, 3x GDP, almost 3x GDP. Hmm. The question that I'm asking is that with yields having made such a big jump up, should one start thinking through lower multiples to GDP growth for air growth, air, air traffic growth from here on? So let me clarify your question. When we say it's a multiple of GDP, we're talking of revenues. So yes, at a certain period, revenues might have gone up three times, and revenues um, in, across the world, whatever the GDP is, the revenue will grow around two and a half times. That's the norm. Within that, the industry players can say, okay, I have this much of revenue coming, do I need more volume to be pushed, or do I want yields to remain high? And that will depend on all players and, and their individual behavior. But the total revenue growth will not slow down. It will be two times, two and a half times the GDP growth. Uh, that clarifies. Uh, the second question that I had uh, was more on the ability of uh, better placed airlines like Indigo to earn slightly more on a relative basis. Now, with the yields already being so high, um, are the opportunities to price uh, uh, your offering um, at slightly higher rates, becoming are, are they becoming easier or more difficult? Uh, so it's about the same. But look, uh, our yields are better than the industry, right? And they're increasing faster than the industry. And the question is why, and maybe your secondary question is, is that sustainable? Why are our yields growing faster than the industry? Number of factors. First, I'll start with the network. Our network has more penetration, our network provides more frequency, and importantly, our network provides better connectivity. So if you're going from point A to point B, there might be six airlines flying it, but Indigo through its connectivity gives you far better options than anyone else. Morning, afternoon, evening, we give you all the options. 
So our connectivity is a huge reason for customers to book us over everyone else. So that's one. Second, as I said, is overall service, reliability, etc. And third is, I would say trust. You know, whether, if, whether we have a disruption, we have a plan B, if we have a refund to be made, we are very, very diligent in making sure, hey, let's not hold into a customer's money. Give it back fast. Uh, if your bags are lost, I tell you, we have a team that's like uh, aces. They go around finding lost bags, lost knapsacks, lost laptops. Uh, so this whole is package of network, customer service, trust, all this builds into higher yield. And that's why yields are going up. And yeah, I believe they're sustainable. Thank you. Mr. Mongya, may we request that you return to the question queue for follow-up questions. The next question is from the line of Achal Kumar from HSBC. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, um, uh, thank you for uh, the opportunity. Um, so I have uh, two, actually. So one, uh, uh, Mr. Datta, if you could please uh, uh, take a slight deeper dive um, into the network. Uh, so basically, if you could talk a little bit more about how the metro, metro, metro to metro routes are performing, how metro to not metro are performing, where the yields are high, and how the competitive landscape looks like, look, because everybody's sort of trying to enter metro to non metro because there the yields are much better. Um, fair enough. Um, and we can understand that. But, but if the, with the rising competition, of course, there'll be a yield under pressure because the demand has not developed fully there. And similarly, you know, domestic versus international, how do you see the international? Because the fares are very competitive. On Dubai, you're flying uh, for 14,000, and it's also flying for 14,000. So it looks like the competition is very high. So if you could talk about, uh, take a deeper dive into the network. Secondly, on the, on the inflation side, of course, the inflation is rising, uh, so sorry, inflation is rising, and uh, there was an unhappiness uh, between your employees about, uh, uh, about the salary increase, especially on the pilot side, but, but, but then with the rising inflation, that actually could grow. So how, so, so how do you see the situation there? Uh, what sort of uh, things um, you need to do? Would that add pressure to the cost? So the are two questions you could talk about, please. Okay. Uh, so first on the network. Um, and the network, as, as you know, and this is not new, there has been a shift. Uh, in the sense that uh, I said three, four years ago, it was all about, oh, metro to metro is so profitable, there are our best routes, and everyone's like filing into metro to metro. Uh, that has clearly changed. Uh, metro to metro is still uh, strong, but metro to non metro, as you've said, is, is, is getting stronger. Now, within metro to metro, though, a huge part of it is corporate travel. And I'm pleased to say that corporate travel is coming back. Yes, we took a sharp hit, but everything says they're coming back, and therefore metro to metro profits are also increasing. Um, metro to non metro, um, we have a lot of unique stations that we've gone into. Uh, therefore, we have a lot of unique segments, and, 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 and so that by itself is good. Within that also, um, metros are so well positioned uh, that if you're going from, I'll just make this up, if you're going from Bhuvaneshwar to Surat, we'll give you six different ways of getting there at, at five different times of the day. That's a huge advantage for us in terms of yield. So if you look at pricing then, um, clearly everyone prices to match. Uh, and uh, 90 days out, everyone has matched. 60 days out, everyone has matched. And then 15 days out, everyone's matched. The question is, which airline is getting a higher proportion of the 90-day pricing and which airline is getting a higher proportion of the 15-day pricing? That's where advantage comes in. Uh, because of everything that I mentioned, service, uh, network, etc., we tend to get more of the 15-day pricing. All of this is a network yield game, and the uh, sort of unique, strong network results in the higher yield. Um, I, or international. International, um, yes, um, the markets to the Middle East are very strong for everyone, I'm sure. Now, within that, uh, what are our advantages? Uh, you mentioned Emirates. Well, Emirates will have a certain number of seats, but they are looking at more uh, towards the beyond. So they are pricing in such a way as to get more and more of the beyond connection. We are pricing in the local market. And, and that's where we have a strength with the narrow body. We do quite well, and therefore, the Middle East looks good. Um, uh, I think that's what you asked me on international specific. Now I'll switch to the employee side. Look, our overall strategy is 
engage with the employees, focus on the employees. If we do that, the employees in turn will focus on the customers. And if they do that, the customers in turn will create shareholder value. So it really is a chain of doing everything right for the employees, not just pay in terms of working conditions, engagement, all of that, so that we get better customer service, so that we get shareholder value. We are in an inflationary environment. We've gone through a very difficult period, first of pay cuts and then not full restoration of pay. And and we know we have to address this issue, but uh, you know, as they say, majburi hai. We do have a big loss. So much as we just like to give everyone pay raise, uh, we have to take into account the sort of losses that we are piling up. Uh, so we have to manage this very carefully. But I will say this: our heart is with the employees. We want to do the right thing for them. We'd love to give them um, uh, more pay raises. So our heart with them, but our head has to work in terms of let's be profitable. Um, so overall, I, I think our employees have, have been resilient. Uh, I think they're extremely loyal. We take all these surveys, and, and I think they understand. Um, so again, it's not a easy walk in the park. It's something we have to manage very carefully. But we'd like to do the right thing for our employees. Right. Uh, sorry, sorry, Mr. Dutta. I was actually Emirates was an example which I was happy to. I wanted to understand the overall international network on the Southeast or Southeast Asian countries, on on North Asian countries, and all. So Emirates was just an example which I gave. Okay. So so let's talk of our international strategy. Um, fact is, India is surrounded by strong hubs, uh, which carry a lot of connecting traffic. And what we have discovered through the COVID process is the incredible amount of charter demand we got for point to point. And we're like, how did these people get to these before COVID and the shutdown and so forth? And the answer is they all went one stop. Well, if there's so many one stop, we obviously have a unique opportunity to go nonstop. And I'll just make up some example. Let's say you're trying to get to Bali or you're trying to get to Manila or you're trying to get to Hamburg. How do you get there? Well, you get a one stop on someone uh, with a three hour stop layover, et cetera, et cetera. And we want to do all this nonstop. So we're looking for all these opportunities. COVID has given us a great uh, learning and uh, feedback into uh, insights into markets. And we're eager to go as soon as we have some more aircraft available. So right now we're quite hungry for aircraft. As I said before, our count is not going up. Uh, we'd like to uh, increase the count. But I also want to stress the code share um, applicability to all of this. Uh, and you look at Doha, you look at Istanbul, um, all these connections where the other side is flying passengers in and then connecting to our network, uh, that's a very profitable business for us as well. And so international has always been margin-wise better. It will continue to be margin-wise better. <clears throat> and to Southeast Asia, um, we have more challenges right now, but I think it's temporary. Whether it's Thailand or Malaysia, softer to build up, but I think we'll do fine. Thank you. Mr. Kumar, may we request that you return to the question queue for follow-up questions. The next question is from the line of Mohit. Adnani from Crystal, please go ahead. Yes, thank you. I want to understand has the booking cycle moved, has the booking curve sort of expanded than before? Because I remember saying in uh, hearing one of the con calls that because of the pandemic in FY21 and FY22, India had moved from already a shorter booking cycle to even shorter because people are not sure what the condition would be. But do you see it going back to pre COVID levels now or even say further because since the D15 uh, fare cap is still there? And fair is a high. Are we seeing people booking more in advance than before? Yeah, so uh, the booking cycle has almost become the same as it used to be the pre COVID level. And we are seeing almost a similar kind of booking patterns. More so with the 15 days uh, you know, pricing, which is right now currently enforced uh, by the government. So we are seeing the booking cycle getting back to the pre COVID level. Uh, what is also happening is. Uh, you know, on the international side, we are seeing uh, even better than the pre-COVID level as for the advanced bookings are concerned. So we are seeing a higher percentage of the people booking in advance uh, 30 days out uh, compared to what they were doing uh, prior to COVID. Okay, and I just had a quick follow-up. Uh, not exactly a follow-up. I want to know that 
with you know three recent incidences of the CFM engine having shut down and the DTC having taken notice of that. Do we foresee any delay in receiving the new 320 neos, which are going to be powered by the CFM engine set? Let's work on here. So we don't foresee any delays in how the aircraft are delivered to us. And I have to say, in operations as we have that scale of operation, an engine engine shutdown is a uh, a normal case of um, not normal in the way that we want to have it, but uh, it happens from time to time. There are clearly statistics who show that, which show that, and, but our crew is trained, our pilots are trained to handle such situation, and uh, we don't foresee any any changes in our fleet planning. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Pramod Kumar from UBS. Please go ahead. Yeah, I've asked lots of opportunity. Uh, my question relates to the cargo business. Uh, Mr. Kumar, sorry to interrupt you. Please use the handset mode. The audio is not clear. Uh, is it better now? Yes. Yes. Yeah, well, thanks a lot. Uh, uh, my question is uh, pertaining to the cargo side. Uh, uh, given the recent announcement of a 50% 50% each joint venture with uh, UPS, just want to understand uh, some more details about it uh, uh, in terms of whether does it uh, kind of uh, uh, is in over and above the uh, your own freighter plan, and also is there any overlap or your existing uh, 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 the the freight what you carry on the passenger aircraft will it be also part of that joint venture? Uh, so to begin with that, and I have a follow-up on the uh, on the on the cargo side. So first of all, the cargo um, arrangement between UPS and the Interglobe IG Group um, that has nothing to do with us. Uh, that's a standalone operation. Uh, they have their own uh, agreements. It has no impact on Indigo whatsoever. Um, we of course uh, carry UPS. We uh, we serve, not carry. Um, we serve UPS. We serve FedEx. We serve DHL. So we are neutral to all of those, and we try to do as best as we can by each one of those um, providers. <clears throat> On our own, of course, we are quite bullish on the cargo business. And as you know, we have four freighters coming. Uh, and cargo has done very well through the COVID period, and we expect that to continue. Uh, but there's no relationship at all between what we're doing on the cargo uh, and what IG Group is doing on their side. Okay, so uh, that, that's good, Darona, for you to clarify, because I was wondering why there was no exchange filing from your side uh, or to this effect. Uh, so in a way, it's kind of a promoter is driving this business separately with UPS. Uh, but you know, isn't there a bit of an issue then because Indigo itself has its own trade plans and, and so isn't there a bit of an issue there in terms of uh, 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 both promoters, same uh, promoter group companies competing for the business? Uh, I'm, I'm just a bit surprised. As I said, this will be totally arm's length. Uh, we do business with the UPS, we do business with FedEx, uh, we do business with DHL and we continue to do that. Uh, they have their own uh, relationship. It has really has no overlap, nothing to do with us. Um, no sort of tentacles between the two companies. Thank you. Mr. Kumar may very request that you return to the question queue for follow-up questions. Next question is from the line of Iqbal Khan from Edelweiss. Please go ahead. Yeah, yeah hi, sir. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Yeah, hi. Uh, sir, uh, I mean, uh, talking about the cargo uh, uh, portion as well, uh, can you please uh, tell me, I mean, uh, how much was the cargo revenue for this quarter? Like, if I'm not wrong, last quarter it contributed around 20% of the total mix. So can you just uh, give me the number on that? And how do you see the corporate travel uh, 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 corporate travel recovering? Has it been 100% uh, uh, of the pre-COVID levels now? Uh, when uh, it, uh, this Sanjay, is my first I'll, question. I'll, I'll let Sanjay address the corporate travel. Yeah, so on the corporate travel side, we have seen a complete recovery of the pre-COVID level, as far with the pre-COVID level. Especially okay. in the month of March, we had almost 64% uh, of recovery taking place on the corporate travel side. But now, last two months, especially in the month of April and May, we are seeing uh, pre-COVID level or even higher traffic than the pre-COVID level. So going forward, I think we are quite bullish about the corporate recovery as well as uh, the business growing from the pre-COVID level. Okay. And the cargo, yeah, our year-over-year -year numbers show 31% growth. So, as I, as I said, cargo is strong, and we, and all the signs are that cargo will continue to be very strong going forward. Uh, 
so how much was it uh, in the overall uh, revenue mix in this quarter uh, i don't need to go into that level of detail i'm sorry okay and sir just one uh, you know you mentioned that the capacity addition in first quarter was 2.5x of the q1 uh, fy21 fy22 uh, was that correct is this what i have yeah. Yes, and how much is it? And how much would you anticipate for the entire financial year 23? Uh, we gave the number. What was this? Uh, so we'll we'll be around 50 to 60 percent higher than than what we closed 2022 with. Okay. Okay. Cool. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That answers my question. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Pulkit Patni from Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Uh, so thank you for taking my questions. Uh, so my first question is uh, on on yields. So we've obviously got that that uh, you know floor price, which is still something that is supporting us. Uh, I guess there should be some charters as well. Uh, as well. So just to get a sense, how much do you think of the yield that we are getting today? Uh, could have a bit of artificial support because of these factors, or do you think these yields are absolutely pure yields? and and even if the support goes it shouldn't have an impact anything that you can quantify there would be pretty helpful for us that's my question number 1 okay so look um yield uh, sorry the pricing bands have a floor and they have a ceiling uh, for a long time you we all sitting on the floor the prices were doing what they were doing but we were all sort of managing at the floor now they've come sharply off the floor They haven't hit the ceiling at all, or anywhere near it. So there's still room to grow, um, but uh, they are sort of now in between the ceiling and the floor. Uh, I, if you, if look, it's impossible to give a scientific answer. You can only give a gut feel answer. So my gut feel is that the Indian economy is strong. That there has been a structural shift in the way people think of air travel. um people travel more people who could afford it are spending more on on travel and vacation getting together with family and people before who couldn't afford it now can afford it and some of them can afford it because income levels have gone up some of them can actually afford it because the employers are now paying for it and some of them just sort of do a trade off mentally of i'm going from jaipur to chennai and i can lose four days wages by train or i can pay a slightly higher fare on indigo so i think there's a big structural shift of more people flying more often and substitution of air versus rail i think this is not only it's sustainable i think it's we just seen the beginning of this phenomena so there's a long way to go in this uh, everything that i've said yeah it's starting off but boy it's got a long way to go so i'm very bullish on aviation traffic and yield in india uh, and say so international charters does this still form part of uh, the the uh, fewer and fewer as as the international is opened up we've moved from charter to schedule uh, but international again there's a lot of room for growth i mean uh, again as i keep saying uh, look at the traffic between milan and delhi and how the hell does it get here well, not non stop on anybody it's all coming to doha and dubai and whatever else and it's like come on let's get a plane and fly delhi milan so there's lots of opportunity here on this sure sir so my second question more of an observation i mean uh, to one of the previous questions you mentioned that this uh, this uh, upi jv is with the with the ige group but the fact that we are also getting into cargo getting dedicated freighters at a time when this is a joint venture with the promoter i mean isn't that conflict of interest i mean if you could just explain this how would it eventually work because obviously we were very bullish about about cargo which we are focusing on as a as a company and at that time the the uh, jv happens with the with the promoter company if you could just explain that a little better it will be helpful there is absolutely no conflict here so we have uh, i don't know 100 shareholders each of them do their own thing now if one of our shareholders wants to get into the cargo business another of our shareholder wants to get into the shipping business what concern is it of ours and what does that shareholder expect us to do nothing just ignore them we'll do our thing they'll do their thing and and also again i don't know exactly what this is 
but just knowing UPS, I'm guessing they'll focus more on small shipments and uh, service travel, I mean, uh, transportation. We won't. We're looking at consolidated shipments, probably going international. So, hey, it's like two ships in the, passing in the night. We have nothing to do with each other. Each other. We don't signal each other. We just ignore each other. Thank you, Mr. Padni. May we request that you return to the question queue for follow-up questions. The next question is from the line of Joseph George from IFL. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Is the audio clear? Yes. Sure, thank you. I have uh, three questions. Firstly, uh, uh, you know, uh, what is the impact of rising interest rates on lease rentals? Uh, that is one. Uh, second is uh, when I do the math with respect to utilization rates, uh, expected utilization rate of uh, uh, aircraft for FY23 based on the fact that you're guiding to a 55% uh, growth in ASKM without a significant increase in uh, fleet size, it comes up to about 11 hours. I want to understand whether there is scope to increase this further and given that uh, your uh, international share as we go ahead will increase compared to your own history, uh, whether there is a, a whether there's scope to incre increase the utilization beyond what we have seen uh, in the past. Uh, that was the second question. I'll take the third one after maybe the response to the first and the second. So uh, aircraft utilization, very good question. And yes, a lot of the growth is coming from increased utilization. And, and part of this is uh, a domestic international mix. Uh, the great thing about uh, domestic international is domestic flies in the day, international flies in the night. So it just works beautifully for us. Um, if there is an objective, target, uh, feasible number we're shooting for, we'd like to be at about 13 and a half hours utilization. And we're a long way from there. So a big part of this, oh, year over year growth is so high and 70% growth and all that, a lot of it is just casually coming from utilization. Um, the next question, um, what is the impact of interest rates on leasing costs? So clearly there is a correlation. Um, but uh, as of date, uh, we see it uh, still not large numbers where we see an impact. And we are sort of booked far out. So it's not like we're doing leasing transactions for next year's deliveries. We are booked far out. So those deals are sort of done and sealed and signed. So in, uh, for next few years, at least, we have no issues. But your, your point is well taken. If interest rates go to 16% or some huge number, would there be an effect on leasing? Of course, there will. But we are not seeing that anywhere near anything like that yet. Uh, understood. So just to um, you know, get a clarification, so the current lease rentals are all locked in uh, at a particular interest rate, not uh, governed by variable rates. Right? And I don't want to say all or nothing. Well, most of them, the ne active negotiations, but we don't do leasing arrangements for the next six months. We do them two, three years out. So yeah, a huge bulk of them are all done. Understood. The last question that I had is, uh, you know, you're guided for a 50 to 60 percent growth in ASKM. That number sounds, uh, you know, very good because we're going to be much higher than uh, pre-COVID levels. I want to understand what is the confidence level um, uh, on maintaining load factors and yields. I mean, increasing capacity by 50 to 60 percent is one thing, but doing that while maintaining load factors at optimum uh, levels, um, you know, maybe north of 80 percent and uh, sustaining high yields. Uh, uh, how do you see that playing out? So again, it's the full package that I want to talk about. And I'll repeat everything that I've said in different questions. Indian economy, very strong. Indian aviation, lots of opportunities around us internationally. Indigo's position in terms of high customer service and therefore disproportionate share of revenue, very strong. The dynamics of the Indian aviation of more people traveling, more people traveling more frequently, more people willing to pay a higher price, very strong. So when I put those all things together, what is the confidence level? Very, very high. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the last question for today. On behalf of Indigo, that concludes this conference call. Thank you all for joining us, and you may now disconnect your lines.